At the end of the day, it saves more money because what does a work requirement do? Instead of borrowing money from China to pay somebody to sit on the couch, we now give them the process to go get a job. Every study has shown when you do that, it puts more people to work. And when they work, what happens? More people are paying into Social Security and Medicare. It's just undue hardship. It's sick. It's cruel. And all it does is satisfy the Republican Party's need to punish someone. Now, Lily Roberts, writing for the Center for American Progress earlier this year, said that work requirements for welfare end up costing more than it saves. Work requirements for welfare end up costing more than it saves. Well, of course it does. And it creates the very thing Republicans purport to hate the most, layer upon layer of bureaucracy. She writes that Arkansas in 2018 insisted that recipients of Medicaid find work, but that didn't increase the number of people working. 16,000 residents of Arkansas lost their health care coverage because they couldn't find work and they were left to die. Let me repeat. Austerity, because we don't tax the rich, 16,000 residents of Arkansas lost their Medicaid and were left to die. And the experiment ended up costing the state of Arkansas, as well as the federal government, $26 million. Why? It cost $26 million to implement the procedure of forcing people who need Medicaid to work. You got to keep track of these people, make sure they're working. All that newly created paperwork cost Arkansas $26 million. And employment, nobody found work. At the time, Arkansas's Republican governor was Asa Hutchinson, who is now running for president. He's challenging Donald Trump as the, the more moderate, kinder, and gentler Republican. 16,000 residents of Arkansas lost their Medicaid because of Asa Hutchinson. Iowa is now implementing, this is my favorite. You're going to love this. Iowa is now implementing work requirements in order to receive food stamps. It is estimated the bureaucracy created to administer these work requirements will cost two and a half times more than the food stamps. Do you mind if I repeat that a thousand more times? It is estimated the bureaucracy Iowa created to administer work requirements for food stamps will end up costing Iowa two and a half times more than the food stamps. This is what Kevin McCarthy has put on the table in the debt ceiling talks, making people work for food stamps and Medicaid. He is proposing that in order to bring down the debt, we spend more on punishing needy people than on what it costs to give them a helping hand. It's cheaper to help people. I wish I was making all this up. I really do. Republican policy isn't about cutting deficits or saving money. It never was. It's about making a handful of Americans richer by lowering their taxes. And the Republicans get away with this by satisfying the bloodlust of financially illiterate Republican voters who want to punish someone, anyone, even when it's themselves. And this works out perfectly for both parties. Republicans get to win elections by appearing cruel, and Democrats get to win elections by appearing kind, right? By June 1st, the brinkmanship will end, and we know the debt ceiling will be raised. We're not going to default on our debt because the wealthiest five families in America would lose a little money. What's going to happen is Biden will call it a win on June 1st because he's the good guy who prevented work requirements for food stamps and Medicaid because that's not who we are. And we'll go, oh, I like him. He's looking out for the poor. He saved food stamps and Medicaid when food stamps and Medicaid should never, ever have been on the table. Democrats need the Republicans to put food stamps and Medicaid on the table. 
And Republicans will call it a win because they demonized the weak and terrorized the poor. It's a win-win. But neither party will behave responsibly by going up against their Wall Street donors and getting rid of those Trump tax cuts that will cost us $3.3 trillion. We're going to add $3.3 trillion to our debt because we won't get rid of the Trump tax cuts. So all of this, everybody's terrified. We're going to default. It's man-made, more man-made than climate change. It's political posturing. And yes, I do agree the debt ceiling is too high. I do agree that America must live within its means. Don't spend money, America, that you don't have. But that doesn't mean that we cut spending. It means taxing billionaires out of existence. And we can start getting rid of billionaires by getting rid of the Trump tax cuts. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. Anthony Lowenstein is an Australian German freelance investigative journalist, author and filmmaker. His latest book is entitled The Palestine, sorry, The Palestine Laboratory. It's published by Verso Books. Everybody should go to the Verso website and buy The Palestine Laboratory, How Israel Exports the Technology of Occupation Around the World. This is what Antony writes, how Israel makes a killing from the occupation. Israel's military industrial complex uses the occupied Palestinian territories as a testing ground for weaponry and surveillance technology that they then export around the world to despots and democracies. For more than 50 years, occupation of the West Bank and Gaza has given the Israeli state invaluable experience in controlling an, quote-unquote, enemy population, the Palestinians. It's here that they have perfected the architecture of control. Welcome, Anthony Lowenstein. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. So these are some difficult questions that we, we have to ask about Israel. Are you Jewish? I am. Do you believe Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state? I'm anti-Zionist, so I suppose I believe Jews have the right to live safely. Absolutely. But uh, and I, years ago, I did support Israel as a Jewish state, probably because it was fairly, it's still, I think, the majority Jewish position, regardless of where you are. But no, to me, I think today the idea of a Jewish state, I think, is an anathema to a fully democratic state. But just to be clear, I'd say the same thing if you asked me, do I believe in a Muslim majority state or Hindu majority state like, say, India? How did you becoming, how did you end up with an Australian accent? Where are your parents and grandparents from? Parents were born in Australia in 43. Grandparents both got out from Germany and Austria in 39. Just before the war on my father's side, they had been after Kristallnacht in 38, they'd been imprisoned by the Nazis in Dresden, thankfully not a concentration camp, but I say just a Nazi prison, so that was better than obviously a concentration camp. Got did they try for America first, or did they just go straight to Australia? I don't think they tried the US. My understanding is, I mean, you know, at that time it was, do you have a relation somewhere, can you get a visa? And so many right. countries didn't want to take Jews, right? Um, Australia took some. They came to Australia in '39. Other family went. There were some who went to the U.S. and the and Canada, and the U.K. But yeah, they came in '39. And back then, yeah, well, Australia was very different then. I mean, probably most people listening to this will have an image of what Australia is. I think these days the image is very stereotypical. It's always sunny, you know, and there's kangaroos right. and all that stuff, which is not entirely always untrue. But right. yeah, it's it's. It's a bit different to that. OK, I grew up with a narrative that Israel was surrounded by five hostile nations. I think it's five. And then they had the internal problem of the Palestinians. They were a nation constantly under attack. Is that true? Was there a period where Israel, after its founding, was 
under attack from Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and internally from the Palestinians. Was that narrative true up until 67? There is some truth to that. Yes, obviously in 48, there was a war. Um, a lot of the neighboring Arab states didn't want to or accept a Jewish state. We can argue, as I've written elsewhere, not in this book, but I've written elsewhere about why that happened and whose fault that ultimately was. But yes, I think it'd be fair in the past and today to say that there are still many forces in the Arab and Muslim world that don't like Israel and frankly don't like Jews. I'm, my eyes are clear eyed about that. I'm not denying that reality. So was um, there ever an existential threat to the Jews living in the Middle East after the founding of Israel. Is it true that Iraq expelled 500,000 Jews after the founding of Israel? Is it true that there were leaders in the Middle East who didn't necessarily want to exterminate the Jews like Hitler, but subjugate them, take over Palestine and subjugate the Jews? Is that a accurate narrative? Um, after 48, there were some Arab states that did not want Jews to remain living in their borders. Some of the countries you mentioned is true. There was definitely not mass extermination, and I would not compare it to as some people who support Israel do what happened in Israel-Palestine in 48, which was the forced expulsion of roughly 750,000 Palestinians. Yes, but there were some Arab states that didn't particularly because of Israel's birth, and said, well, if you want a Jewish state, go live there. Now, some Jews wanted to live in Israel and some did not, but they didn't have always a lot of choice. I think in 1973, the Yom Kippur War, most people would say that that was a war that, I don't want to say Israel could have lost, but it was maybe the, the only war in its history, 75 years old now, that Israel felt threatened. There was a threat whether it would have destroyed Israel, I think, is an arguable point. But well, the, the, the Yom Kippur War, the narrative is that America, Henry Kissinger, bailed Golda Meir out. That had America not come to Israel's aid during the Yom Kippur War, it's questionable. How much does Israel need America? How much did uh, Israel need America during the Yom Kippur War? And how much does uh, Israel need America right now? America and Israel have a weird relationship. I call it, it's like an abusive partner relationship. And what I mean by that is there's no doubt in many, many years since 48, particularly since 67, America often has had Israel's back, so to speak, at the UN, diplomatically, politically, um, militarily. But there's also this weird distrust that exists between the nations. I talk about this in my new book that, yes, they're close allies, and I don't think Israel would really either exist or exist as it currently is without the US support, but both countries massively spy on each other. They don't really fully trust each other a lot. I say in the book that the latest information we have is that every single day at the NSA, America's leading intelligence gathering department, there are roughly 400 Hebrew speakers that essentially their job is to spy on Israel. And the are, they spying, are they spying because America is competing with Israel to sell weapons? Well, that is something I talk about in the book. You know, in the last few years, there's been all this talk of the Biden administration trying to censor or censure, I should say, Israeli spyware. Some people have heard of Pegasus, the spyware that goes on your cell phone. And they have done that. But I say, and I argue in the book and I show that I think this is more about, as he said, America not wanting competition. America wants to be the leading arms dealer and seller and developer in the world. And they are. They remain 40% of the world's arms dealing. No one really comes close to the US. Israel is the 10th biggest arms dealer in the world. And they have a sort of symbiotic relationship, certainly many times in the last decades, at times even when the US would not sell weapons to the most repressive regimes imaginable. Like South Congress, Africa. Like South Africa. Well, America sold a lot of weapons to them, but even at the end when America, for a variety of different reasons, stopped selling, Israel was South African apartheid's friend to the end. And as I talk about it in the book, David, it's not, that to me, that relationship was very important because it wasn't just weapons. It was an ideological alignment. They both actually admired each other in terms of in South Africa, 
obviously they were what they both argued they were fighting a war against barbarism essentially against either black South Africans or Palestinians. And although South Africa, you know, South African apartheid ended in '94, I would argue there is still a form of economic apartheid there, but politically it ended decades ago. But Israel was deeply inspired by that to the point where Israeli officials, Israeli prime ministers would openly say, and some of this stuff has come out also through declassified documents in the last decade or so, that they looked to what South Africa was doing with their bantistans, so to speak, these black townships that uh, South Africa said gave blacks self-determination, which was nonsense. It was basically kind of nominally self-controlled, but essentially controlled by the white government. That's what's happening in the West Bank. And Ariel Sharon, a former prime minister, openly said one of his models for the West Bank was what South Africa was doing. And to some extent, that's what Israel has created. In the so West they Bank. learned by cooperating with South Africa when the rest of the world was boycotting South Africa. Israel learned how to maintain an apartheid state. Yes. And I mean, to be clear, the US and many other Western powers were friends with South Africa for most of its history. It was really only at the tail end when the US decided to turn the other cheek and join most of the world by then in in rejecting South African apartheid. But as I said, Israel was a friend to South African apartheid till the end. Right. So apartheid, uh, I'm going to say 1990, South Africa released Nelson Mandela. I'm going to assume within a year, I don't have an almanac in front of me, but South Africa got rid of... 94. 94 94. got rid of apartheid. Yeah, so Mandela's release obviously facilitated negotiation, talks, etc. And within four years, it was, yeah. So the, 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 the narrative that I'm given is that in 2000, on Clinton's way out, he held these meetings with Ehud Barak, who was the uh, head of Israel. I think he was prime minister of Israel. And Yasser Arafat, head of the PLO, the uh, Palestinian Authority. And they were within inches of a two-state solution. We are told here in the United States that Yasser Arafat said, I could sign this, but my people will kill me. But you're suggesting that this was six years after this unholy alliance between Israel and South Africa, and they were already figuring out a way to maintain an apartheid state? I mean, Israel had been obviously working on that for years. Of course, the occupation started in 1967. So those relations between Israel and South Africa and apartheid were pretty solid by the 70s. And to the point where South Africa, for example, was desperate for uranium for a nuclear bomb. And we can thank God that never actually happened. Because who knows what they would have done with it. And Israel was trying to assist them in that process. By 94, when it ended, Israel, I think, in some ways, was already pretty deep into the occupation. There obviously had been the first intifada in the late 80s. And of course, the second intifada started in 2000. I mean, there's obviously a lot of talk, particularly in the US, but in much of the West, and particularly by supporters of Israel, that... We've offered so much, the Palestinians won't talk, won't accept, won't capitulate, and essentially they want all the land and we're not going to give it to them and therefore that's why there's an ongoing unresolved war. And I guess that's a narrative, A, I don't accept, but secondly, because there's no real evidence that at any time, even when there was the signing on the White House lawn, the infamous signing, people can see that if they haven't watched it, you know, Clinton, Arafat, um, And, you know, if there was a peace process in the 90s, Israel's occupation doubled in size. Right. Now, how one can be committed to peace while doubling the settler population is, frankly, an anathema. And there's no doubt, you know, if we were talking, David, in 1995 or any of that period where there was so much euphoria around what was possible... It's going to be a two-state solution within a matter of years, we were told. There was there were voices that were critical. Ed, you know, um, Edward Said, the famous Palestinian... From Colombia. Who's, indeed, who has passed away a number of years ago. But he was a very prominent op- op- opponent, saying this is not going to lead to peace. This is all a sham. He was not... I'm not saying he wasn't taken seriously, but he was a, a minority view in the wider picture. He was right. I talk about some of this in the book, that... 
Yes, we see today a far-right Israeli government empowered by Netanyahu and other figures around him, but these trends started long before that, which is why I often find it pretty frustrating that the Western media is obsessed with Netanyahu, that he's somehow this key Machiavellian figure. He's a Obviously, he's a prime minister. He's clearly an important figure. I'm not denying that. But the problem here and the issue is not simply Netanyahu. Like, he wasn't in power, say, last year, and the settlements keep keep expanding. What are there about half a, and and, half a million settlers now in the West Bank? Well, in, including East Jerusalem, there's 750,000. And in 2000, what, and, and 2000, what was it, 40,000 when they were doing the no, campaign? It was more than that. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. It was way less. And I mean, there's certainly, it's massively expanded in the last decade. And in fact, the current government is, has a vision for, well, the more extreme elements, one to two million settlers. And one of the things that I think is likely to happen in the coming years, there aren't enough Jews to settle the West Bank. There, there aren't, aren't enough. Jews who want to go. No, I mean, there are you know, 14, 15 million Jews around the world. So there's a lot of, lot of Jews, but most of them don't want to live in the West Bank. And a lot of Israeli Jews who live in Israel proper don't want to live there. So what does Israel do? I think what is not unlikely is that they start encouraging and accepting evangelical Christians. Now, they're not Jewish, obviously, but they're very pro-Israel, not all of them, but many. They love the settlements. They often go there now on trips, assisting settlers. They don't live there. I think it's conceivable that Israel will allow those people to come in there because they're in inverted commas committed to the cause. We're talking with Anthony. Numbers. We're talking with Anthony Lowenstein. He's the author of the Palestine Laboratory. It's published by Verso Books. Go buy the Palestine Laboratory. It is a book about how Israel exports the technology of occupation around the world. When you say Israel has a military industrial complex. I think of the American military industrial complex. It's hard for me and most Americans to wrap our heads around the brutal reality that there are people in our government and private sector who view war as a constant in nature. So why not make money off of it? Are there. Who is the Israeli military industrial complex? Are they your classical war profiteers who look at the West Bank and Gaza as a business opportunity in terms of dropping bombs and the serve? I would assume the real money is in turning Gaza and the West Bank into a surveillance state. It's both. Where is there more money? Is there more money in bombs or more money in knowing exactly who? each individual Palestinian is. Yeah, years ago, I guess before the 2000s, there was, Israel was selling mostly so-called traditional weapons, um, bombs, guns, etc. But in the last 20 years, though they're still selling that, there is increasing, obviously, digital revolution. So they're selling spyware, facial recognition technology, biometric tools. You know, if you ask, pardon me, how many Israelis in this industry view it, in some ways, they don't view it hugely differently to some Americans I've been working on, investigating for other work. I did a book a few years ago called Disaster Capitalism. and did a film about it too, and that was partly inspired by Naomi Klein, the Canadian writer who's written a lot about these issues. And you look at these kinds of people, yes, war is an opportunity in their thinking. So the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, after 9-11 were key areas of testing weapons. I mean, the U.S. has often admitted that. The current war in Ukraine happening right now as we speak. It's a proving ground. stories in the New York Times. It's basically the, the, the Ukrainians are being given or sold weapons by the U.S. and others, and they're being tested against the Russians. So on one level, this is not unique to Israel. However, however, Israel has had for decades in its backyard a, a occupied population, I said 56 years and counting, so there's innumerable opportunities to test all sorts of things. Yes, partly it's surveillance, monitoring all phone calls in and out of the West Bank and Gaza for that matter. Drones, either armed or unarmed, as I said, increasingly in the last 20 years, facial recognition technology, biometric um, data. They're mostly done by private companies, either Israeli or foreign. 
And then what happens in a practical sense is that one would go to an arms fair. You know, this happened all over the world, the US, Europe, even in Australia. And these companies are promoting these tools and technologies as so-called battle tested in Palestine. In other words, they work, so to speak. And you have now over 130 countries, so the majority of nations in the world that have bought in the last decade some form of Israeli technology, defense equipment. Are the Chinese spyware. using any of the technology with the, the Uyghurs? The Chinese do. The Chinese, of course, have developed their own. Uh, and one thing I talk about in the book, actually, is that in the last years, really only in the last four or five years, there's been a, since this was started during the Trump administration, a real shift in how much of the West views China. Until then, China was seen as either mostly benign. I'm not saying that was correct or wrong, but it was seen as more benign. And we were friendly with China. We were, I mean, obviously trading with China hugely then and now. You had literally Western officials going to China to teach each other about counterinsurgency. I mean, that was happening. And obviously that's changed. And now we have a lot of, we being the West, have concerns about China internally and externally. And China does also now export its own tools of repression. As I say in the book, we should be opposed to that. That is deeply disturbing. However, Israel has sold more of this technology and more of these equipment to far more countries. It's not even a comparison. And yet, in much of the Western media, we are said to be deeply concerned about China and its growing militarism in Asia Pacific, where I live and elsewhere. Fine. Whether we accept that or not is debatable. And yet there's very little conversation or concern about Israel, Israel also exporting technology to some of the worst regimes. I mean, literally, Rwanda during the genocide, they're selling tools of repression during the genocide in 94. Israel has been selling um, spyware to the regime in Myanmar in Asia when they're literally committing genocide against Rohingya people. Is it profitable? Is there that much money? To, to yeah. There is that much a money. Lot of money. I mean, we're not talking about trillions, but we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. Yes, absolutely. And Israel basically will sell weapons to anyone. There are very few nations they haven't as far as we're aware north korea syria right i think so iran today but they were selling weapons to iran before the revolution in 79 to the repressive shah right weirdly enough the son of that guy was in israel recently saying he was going to bring peace to iran which was bizarre and comical right. but anyway they is it fair to say anybody. is it fair to say that anti-semitism is on the rise throughout the world but Israel has never been more secure. <laughs> That's an interesting question. There are definitely parts of the world where anti-Semitism is rising, and it worries me as a, as a human and as a Jew. I think there's no question about that. Some countries more than others. But at the same time, are you really secure as a Jew in Israel? As I was saying before, Israel sort of has a problem in a way because not that many Jews in the diaspora are moving there. They're not. Yes, some people move every year. They make so-called aliyah, you know, the term of basically seeing Israel as your homeland. I could go to Israel tomorrow, as could you, David. And within a few months, I would have an Israeli passport if I can prove that my family is Jewish. But not many Jews are doing that, to be honest. They're not. But it's never been uh, safer to be a Jew in Israel. I would, well... I mean, if you're an Israeli Jew, yes, I guess, compared to, say, the Second Intifada, when there are suicide buses blowing the suicide up in Tel Aviv. Bu so is it fair to say Ehud Barak came up with the wall? In terms of security, did the wall work? Did, did the wall prevent the, the, the raft of Palestinians coming over and, and stabbing people and, and blowing themselves up? Did the wall work? in terms of keeping Israelis safe? Well, I guess I would, hmm, I wouldn't say it like that, no. Uh, I mean, for example, having spent time in Palestine, living there for a number of years, there are massive holes in the wall, <laughs> for one. But they allow that. The Don't the Israelis no, allow no, no, the no, no. Well, for workers? Well, they, no, uh, yes, that's obviously, but, but I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the idea that there are holes actually in the wall that Palestinians can come in and out of, but Israel doesn't. It's not approving, so to speak. It happens all across the, the barrier. I've seen it myself. Um, so why are, why are the suicide bombings almost 
non-existent. There's that was been a, some, a political decision by various Palestinian leaders. It wasn't to do with the war. Was and it a political decision because the retaliation was so severe? That was a, one factor, which is why there has not been, since the Second Intifada, a so-called Third Intifada. There's been obviously uprisings here and there. There's been various attacks. A lot of Palestinians that I speak to in the West Bank and Gaza as well are understandably exhausted. I mean, there's no doubt there is so growing are the, support. So do the Israelis view the Palestinians? I'm, I'm going to be blunt here and I apologize. And I've come around. My listeners know that I've come around. And it pains me to say that it's starting to look like an apartheid state. And I say that only because I get a sense that Israel is secure, that Israel is not as threatened is, is it fair to say that a preponderance of Israeli leaders, pardon the expression, view the Palestinians as a cancer and you, you cannot get rid of a cancer, but you can keep it in remission? Is that how they view the, the Palestinians? Yes. I mean, it's not even a question of an opinion. I mean, you can literally find current Israeli government ministers who openly talk about ethnic cleansing. Now, some people might say, that's just crazy extremists in the government. No. Well, I'm not There's saying growing... ethnic cleansing. I'm saying, do they view I it? Know, I know you're saying that but, but that, but there is growing public support. In recent public polling in the last years, close to 50% of Israeli Jews advocate and support ethnic cleansing. So in other words, the forced removal in some way of as many Palestinians as possible to God knows where, what, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, who knows? And years ago, if someone said to me this was more likely than not, people would say that's crazy, that's never going to happen, the world wouldn't accept that. Now my view has changed. Firstly, who would stop it? Think the Arab countries are going to stop it? Their leadership is in bed with Israel and they want Israeli weapons. The EU would release some terse press release and then go back to sleep. How the U.S. would respond is an interesting question. I think if someone like Trump was in the White House, that would be wrapped. If it's someone like Biden, if not Biden, another Democrat, I suspect they would be maybe critical but not necessarily stop it. I mean, this to me is where when you have David spent, not you, when Israel has spent decades occupying another people, you become morally broken. This right. is what happens. You become morally and spiritually broken because the only way you're convinced that you can maintain your existence as a Jewish state is to oppress other people. So in the short to medium term, that will work in inverted commas because no one's stopping you. But in the long run, as more and more people are saying, can an apartheid state exist indefinitely in the 21st century? I would say no. Right. In the short to medium term, yes. Long term, I would say no. We have some questions from our virtual studio audience. I always say what we do overseas to foreigners, we eventually do to ourselves. How free are the Israelis in Israel? Are they more free or less free? Are, are they the victims of a surveillance state? Are they being spied on? I know that 20 percent of Israel is Arab. I would assume uh, Arab sympathizers are spied on, that, that there are Israelis who are less free today. Is Israel a surveillance state for yes. Jews? I mean, the short answer is yes. Clearly, your life as a Palestinian in the West Bank and Gaza is far worse. Your freedom of movement is restricted. There's no doubt about that. But absolutely. In fact, it's come out in the last years that a number of Israeli Jews are being spied on with Israeli spyware. Um, in the protests in the last, not just six months, but in the last years against Netanyahu, there was lots of evidence of Israel spying on those, a lot of those protests as left-wing activists, etc. And Israel itself as a society is actually becoming far more right-wing, if it's, if it's possible to imagine. Most studies show that young Israeli Jews are much more right-wing than their parents, which is a pretty petrifying thought to be honest so are israeli jews free well look they're not living in north korea no right they can travel freely there's freedom of movement to be sure but there is definitely a growing surveillance state and as you say the occupation always comes home yes as we've seen with the u.s right they spent 20 years in iraq and afghanistan two catastrophic wars so much of those tools and technologies that the u.s was using are now used and bought by american police forces yep on the streets of your country right yep so 
And torture. Yeah. Torture. And well, absolutely. Yeah. Well, listen, we're out of time. I'm going to be begging you. I'm going to speak to Leslie about having you back ASAP. Uh, but let's do a speed round. And I apologize to my virtual sure. studio audience. I have some questions from the audience and we only have three minutes left. Short, on, very short, very answers. short um, answers. Yeah. Give me the entire history of the Jewish people. No, I'm kidding. Uh, here's the first question from Brian. Can your guests please contrast and compare the relationship between the U.S. and Israel as it relates to Obama versus Biden? Uh, is Obama was Obama more critical of Israel than Biden? On the practically on the ground, no. Rhetorically, yes. And obviously, right at the end of his presidency, some listeners will remember he basically abstained on a vote at the UN about settlements in Israel, and the Jewish community got very upset. But practically on the ground in Palestine, there was not much difference. Sadly, no. Okay, Larry asks what the relation is between Israel and companies like Palantir and BlackRock. BlackRock is the private equity firm. Mm -hmm. I yes. believe they're helping Ukraine rebuild before they even win. What is Palantir? And what is... Palantir is Peter Thiel, the American billionaire. Oh, great guy. He does a lot of surveillance work. He's a lovely guy. Yes, yeah, big friend of, well, someone. And... Um, I mean, Palantir has done lots of surveillance work with the U.S. military around the world. And I mean, Israel, of course, has its own equivalent of those companies. So it doesn't particularly need a Palantir. But yeah, I mean, America and Israel have, a, as I said, a very close intelligence sharing network while also spying on each other. So it's a kind of a curious, it's an abusive relationship, I think, is the best way to describe it. Right. Leslie asks, which other countries have used Israeli weapons, smart tech, drones, et cetera? You kind of touched on that, but... I mean, so many. As I said, the majority, 130 countries at least in the world have used some form of Israeli defense equipment, spyware. I mean, so the majority of nations in the world, okay. dictatorships and um, democracies. And finally, Larry asks if chat GPT is an outgrowth of surveillance by computer. Wow, that's a big question. I mean, and by the I, way, Larry is an AI bot. So just, <laughs> not a real person. Hi, yeah. Larry. Um, I, I mean, to some extent, the internet. Let's not forget, <laughs> was out that come came out of the US military in the first place. That's what the internet was in its you know early mm -hmm. phases. Look, I think ChatGPT is fascinating. It's potentially very useful. I'm someone who's a bit more skeptical of its um, use, certainly in its current form, mostly because. It's not actually creating anything new. It's simply regurgitating what already exists on the internet. And it doesn't mean it can't change and evolve over the years. But as a journalist, it's probably going to replace simple, basic reporting. But it's hard to see any time soon replacing serious investigative work or foreign reporting. Maybe one day we'll all be made redundant, including you as a host. But I reckon we're a while away from that. Some people would say I already am redundant. Anthony Lowenstein is an Australian German freelance investigative journalist, author and filmmaker. We've only scratched the surface. His latest book is The Palestine Laboratory. Go buy it right now. It's published by Verso. Where would you like them to buy the book? How do they do that? If they go to the Verso website, if they Google it, I mean, I'd encourage people maybe not to use Amazon because of its ridiculous power. But any online bookshop, your independent bookshop, if they haven't got it, tell them to order 50 copies or the Verso website. And buy, find buy 50 one. copies and give them to libraries. Thank you, Anthony. Exactly. Please, I'm, I'm going to beg you to come back maybe next week. Thank you. Thanks, David. Bye. Great. Really great. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic.